We gotta do better than, than that. We gotta have like a major Cynthia. Cynthia! 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 Thank you, Emily. Thank you, thank you, Emily. Thank you, Shauna. Thank you, Zephyr. Thank you, Akeem. And thank you, Sandra. Thank you all for being here today. It's September 1st, right? How many days have we got? 12. Thank you. I am Cynthia Nixon, and I am running for governor of New York State. I am running because I love New York, and I believe in New York, and I know we could have a New York that works for all of us instead of the New York that we have now. Um, I'm a lifelong New Yorker. I was born here. I grew up here. I am a proud public school graduate. And I am a prouder public school parent of three kids. Sam and Charlie and Max, ages 21, 15, and seven. New York is the state where I started working when I was 12 in order to pay for college because my family wasn't able to afford it. New York is the state where I've had my 40 long year career, where I'm raising my kids, where I met and married the love of my life, my wife, Christine. <laughs> where I have fought for LGBTQ equality and for women's rights and for abortion rights and for the last 17 years where I have fought for better funded and particularly more equally funded public schools across New York State. before you because of my first hero and my forever hero, my mother. Because of the way she loved me. And because of the way she believed in me and because of the way she taught me to fight. When I was little, my dad was really troubled and our home was a scary place. And my mother was the opposite of those parents who say, I had to stay together for the children. My mother was the opposite. She said that if I hadn't been born, she never would have left. But she saw the effect that my dad and our home was having on me. And one night she found it inside herself to draw a line in the sand and to tell my dad that he had to go. And when she did that, she saved me. And when she saved me, she saved herself. And she and I moved to a one-bedroom, five-flight walk-up. It was just the two of us, and it was hard sometimes, but it was so much better. And we'd been there maybe three years when she came to me one day very agitated, and she said she'd been suspicious about the rent that we'd been paying ever since we moved in. And she had investigated, and she found that the landlord had been cheating us the whole time we'd been there. And she was so angry because the rent had been so hard for her to come by every month. But more than that, what I remember most was how proud she was of herself. How proud she was that she didn't just take his word for it, that she trusted her intuition and she investigated and she held him accountable. And you know what? She held him accountable retroactively. She got our rent reduced and she got our money refunded. mother was. And at every moment in my life, including right now, when I have stood up, it's because my mother showed me that I could and because my mother showed me 
that I must. And for me, there was no more pivotal moment in my life when I stood up than when my oldest child, Sam, entered kindergarten 17 years ago. And he and I walked into our, that school. And because of budget cuts, it was so different than the school that I had picked out for him a few months earlier when I looked at it. They had fired the assistant principal, the art teacher, the music teacher, and two-thirds of the paraprofessionals. And I was so angry for Sam, and I was so angry for every kid in that building. And I ran into a parent in the halls that I knew, and she told me the cuts were citywide, and there was a protest happening in a few hours, and we should go. And that's when it hit me. This is what the cuts look like in my kid's school on the Upper West Side of Manhattan. So what are the cuts like in Brownsville in the Bronx? And what are the cuts like in Mott Haven in, in uh, excuse me, Brownsville in Brooklyn and Mott Haven in the Bronx? And what are, what are the cuts like across our city in communities of color where the schools are so deeply underfunded to begin with? And Sam and I went to that protest and I held him in my arms and I talked about how angry I was that when the budget is tight, our kids and our schools are always the first thing on the chopping block. And in the months that followed, I joined the, the Alliance for Quality Education. And I went to rally after rally and I started organizing them. And I testified in front of the city council and a whole lot of us parents got arrested. <laughs> and that following spring, we beat back almost $400 million in budget cuts. And I already knew from my mom that sometimes you can fight harder when you fight for your kid, but what I learned that year was that when you join together with other parents and you fight as one for all the kids across the system, you are a mighty force. You are a force to be reckoned with. And that's what I've been doing for the last 17 years. Because New York schools are the second most unequally funded in the entire country. In New York. We've got a $10,000 spending gap per pupil between our 100 richest and our 100 poorest school districts. So what that means is in a school of 500 kids, that's a $5 million gap. Or in a school of 1,000 kids, that's a $10 million gap. And some of the most underfunded schools are in our poor, rural, white areas. But overwhelmingly, the underfunding happens in our majority black and brown schools in our very segregated system, which is completely linked to systemic racism. Yeah. New York State itself is the single most unequal state in the entire country. And that's not just because we have Wall Street and so many millionaires and billionaires here. It is also because we have such crushing poverty. Yes. We have more than half of the kids in our upstate cities living below the poverty line. More than half. Syracuse, for example, has the most concentrated black and brown poverty of any single city in the entire country. And the thing about this kind of crushing inequality is it doesn't just happen on its own. It happens from a choice. It happens from a choice to slash taxes on the super rich and the super connected and to slash services and opportunity on everybody else. And it is the kind of a choice that we're used to seeing made by Republicans like Donald Trump. But for the last eight years, it is a choice we've seen made over and over and over again by our governor, Andrew Cuomo. Now, I don't know about anybody else in this room, I voted for Andrew Cuomo eight years ago because I remembered his dad and because I believed that he was a Democrat the way he said he was. But he lied. Since taking office, he has governed like a Republican and he has handed over massive amounts of power to the Republican Party. Who in this room knows what the IDC is? 
For those of you who don't know, is a group of Democratic state senators that he and the, and the Republican leader incentivized behind closed doors to come over and vote and caucus with the Republicans to give them the majority in the state Senate when they didn't have it. Andrew Cuomo did that, and he also allowed the Republicans in the state Senate to draw their own districting maps, to gerrymander their own districts. With these two transfers of power, he gave the Republicans in New York the ability to block almost every progressive priority we've had for this state, whether you're talking about fully funding our schools, or campaign finance reform, or passing the New York Dream Act, or the Reproductive Health Act, or agenda, or voting reform, or any one of a whole list of priorities that I can name. But he hasn't only governed politically like a Republican, he's governed fiscally like a Republican. Yes. There is a reason that the Koch brothers gave him $87,000 when he ran in 2010. Mm -hmm. That is more than they gave to Scott Walker. It is because they knew that despite him calling himself a Democrat, that his policies were gonna benefit billionaires like them and corporations like theirs, and he has done them proud. The Koch brothers know a good investment when they see one. Since taking office, he has eliminated the bank tax. He has slashed taxes on corporations. He has slashed taxes on everybody earning more than $300,000 a year. He has decimated our state's infrastructure and robbed our cities and our towns and our localities of the most basic services. His 2% austerity budgets have been passed on the backs of our children and our elderly and our economically disadvantaged, our most vulnerable New Yorkers. Yes. I am running for governor because yeah. I believe that we can have a New York that works for all of us. I am running because I am tired of the corruption and the dysfunction in Albany. And I am running because I am tired of fake corporate Democrats who aren't gonna lift a finger to enact change unless their donors say it's okay. Andrew Cuomo has raised $36 million for this campaign from corporations looking to do business with the state of New York, from wealthy individuals looking for a tax break, from people he himself has appointed to office. Of that 36 million, 0.1% has come in in small dollar donations of 200 or less. So what that means, if you're an everyday New Yorker, the chances that Andrew Cuomo is gonna care about your needs are pretty much that, 0.1%. In our campaign, we are not accepting a dime of corporate contributions. York. And I will tell you, I am so proud of the fact that we received more small dollar donations on the first day of our campaign than Andrew Cuomo received in seven years. <laughs> this is a David and Goliath battle but this is a battle we can win. There is a path to victory. Yes. Last year, I mean, last gubernatorial primary, when Governor Cuomo's opponent was Zephyr Teachout, she ran a brilliant campaign. And she, despite the fact of them not putting her on television until the last two weeks, she showed what an incredible hunger there is for a progressive alternative. Zephyr Teachout won 34% of the vote. Less than 600,000 people voted in that election. The people who vote in a Democratic primary, particularly one that's happening on a Thursday, are the most informed 
and the most left-leaning, and to be informed about Andrew Cuomo is to want to change. But let me tell you something that's happened. In the last two years in New York, inspired by Bernie Sanders and horrified by Donald Trump, 583,000 new Democrats have registered to vote in New York. of incumbents and the polls being way off in places like Florida, where four days ago, Andrew Gillum, who was said to only be at 11%, won and is now the Democratic nominee for governor of Florida. They don't understand, they don't understand this moment that we're in. They don't understand this progressive energy. They don't understand that we're here and we're coming. And we're coming for them, so they better get ready. When I am governor of New York, we are gonna fully fund our schools, and I mean all of our schools. a majority of supporters. We can pass single payer here in New York and we can ensure every New Yorker better and cheaper with no co-pays and no deductibles. Banning fracking 
is only a first step and it doesn't mean much if we are still exporting so much fracked gas from Pennsylvania and running the gas through pipelines, if we are still allowing this massive build out of fracked gas infrastructure in power plants and in pipelines and in compressor stations and locking ourselves into decades of fossil fuel infrastructure. I, when I am governor, we will pass the Climate and Communities Protection Act and the Climate and Communities Investment Act. We will hold corporate polluters accountable by enacting a polluters tax. Yeah. and we will use it to turbocharge a just transition to 100% renewable energy. And when we do that, we will create 100,000 plus good green energy jobs across this state in the communities that need it most. A leader in renewable energy is not only good for our health, it's actually a growing industry that New York needs to be in on the ground floor of. When I am governor, we will legalize recreational marijuana in New York. Because first and foremost, it's a racial justice issue. ethnicities use marijuana at the same rates, but 80% of the arrests for marijuana are of black and Latino people. Using marijuana is something that has effectively been legal for white people for a long time. It is time to make it legal for everybody else. And when we bring this multi-billion dollar industry to New York, we have to be sure that it isn't only wealthy white capitalists like John Boehner that are profiting off this system. We have to prioritize the communities and the individuals that have been the most targeted by the war on drugs. And we have to prioritize them for licenses and for small business loans and other supports. We have to take the tens of millions of dollars in tax revenue that will come from this industry to invest them in those in communities, in education, in job creation, and we have to ensure that when we legalize marijuana, we get everyone out of jail who is in jail for marijuana arrest. to do here in New York. We have to stop the over-policing of communities yes. of color. We have to hold police accountable. Black Lives Matter can't just be a slogan. When we say Black Lives Matter, we have to actually do something about it. We have to end solitary confinement. And for Khalif Browder, whose name we know, and for so many others whose names we don't, we need to ensure a right to a speedy trial. We need to ensure a right to discovery. And we need to end cash bail in New York State.
Teachers have access to higher education. We will pass the Liberty Act to stop our law enforcement cooperating with ICE. And I promise you that on the first day of my administration, I will sign an executive order expanding access to driver's licenses for all undocumented New Yorkers. Not having a driver's license is the number one way ICE is coming into our communities, is racially profiling people, is figuring out who is undocumented, is tearing families apart, and is turning New York into a police state. Yes. If we care about fighting back against the Trump agenda, if we care about protecting immigrants in New York where we can, why haven't we done this in New York? We have one of the most progressive voting bases in the country. The only thing that we're lacking is the progressive leadership. <laughs> This is a terrible moment in our country's history with Donald Trump in the White House. But if we view it the right way, this is an incredible opportunity and not just an opportunity. This is an obligation yeah. we have here to enact foundational change and to lead this country in a better direction. We have to send a message we want our Democratic Party to stand for. We want a Democratic Party that says justice is a human right, housing is a human right, education is a human right, health care is a human right. We need to elect more Democrats this year, but we also need to elect better Democrats. are women. And I am so inspired by them. And I am so proud to count myself among their ranks. I'm Cynthia Nixon. I'm running for governor because I love New York. I love all of New York. And I know you do too. And that's why we